She speaks with wisdom and faith. Instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but one who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her, the, give her the reward she has earned, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Thank you, Josiah. It's great to see all of you today. Hopefully the moms have roses, and uh, just wanted to try and say we appreciate you so much and all the things that you've done. I hope your family has made you breakfast and done all kinds of great things for you today. Um, and uh, it's just a day for you to be honored today. And every day. We only set aside one, but you really ought to get it every day. So today is a very special day for that. It's time for families. There's two different ways that you give honor, though. One is just because of a position, right? Everybody had a mother? Anybody who didn't? Okay, just checking. Uh, everybody had one, but that's not really what the honor's about today. The honor today is about somebody who did something special. Because we can have people who have a position and we give them honor because they have the position. If you are a king, you get the honor because you are the king. It may have nothing to do with you personally. It, it may not say anything about the way that you are. Uh, we recognize in the Old Testament, David honored Saul as the Lord's anointed because he was the Lord's anointed, not because he was good, not because of anything about him. So when we talk about mothers today a little bit, I'm not speaking about this just because you gave birth. But this is for all women who have that special quality, who learn to mother people. People think I only had one. That's not true. I have had many. They have tried to raise me and to get me to do what I'm supposed to do. Uh, chances are you've had a whole bunch of people who have tried to mother you as well, and they deserve honor as well because they are the ones who lift us up. They are the ones who encourage us. They are the ones who always are there for us. And so today, we want to talk just a little bit about them and a little bit about that place. Uh, Proverbs 31 is one of those strange passages, and uh, I am not going to preach on it. So I'm just mentioning it here. I thought this was, when I first started preaching, one of the greatest passages on women, and my Mother's Day sermon was on this great woman of Proverbs 31 until I found out the women do not like her. I was like, what? Come on, she's great. And they said, no, she's impossible. <laughs> I said, okay, that makes a lot more sense because that's not what it's about is to say that there are all these possibilities and we lift all of this up as the, as the standard that you have to live to every single day because in a lot of ways you excel this standard on different days. And then there are those other few days, but uh, we won't go into those. So just the end of Proverbs 31, as we look at the woman here that uh, Lemuel talks about, talks about a strong woman. This isn't somebody who's weak. She has strength. She has dignity. She knows where her place is. Boy, this is important today. She owns her house. She rules her house. And I think sometimes we get this a little bit waxed up. We talk about the man being the head of the house, and that's true. He is. He does not run the inside. Please do not run the inside. If you read Proverbs 31 and look at what that passage is about, she runs the inside. That's the biblical way of looking at this. He doesn't make all those decisions about dinner and what's supposed to happen and how it's supposed to happen and all these schedules and everything else. He better pay attention to her. And so be careful with that. You're head of the house, right. And you better watch out for the people who are in your house. 
Let her do that. She is good at it. She knows how to do it. She has this kind of compassion, this kind of strength to be able to accomplish those things. And so as you look through Proverbs 31 without reading it all, men are leaders in the family, but it's her house. She is the one who has all the strength. It's surprising independence at that time. It says she laughs at the future. She is not worried about things. She has wisdom that she shares with people. She teaches children, grandchildren, and she teaches all of us by her example of who she is. She is to be praised. Praised by her children, praised by her husband. Her husband honors her in the gates. Her children pronounce a blessing on her. If there's a mom in your house, I don't care if she's your mom or not, honor her because she deserves it. She has done some good things. And most often those are the ones that don't get noticed because we're familiar. We're used to it. It's what you always do. But boy, there ought to be a time when that recognition comes. And so <clears throat> I wanted to be able to share a little bit with you today about maybe what this is like in a story that is an interaction between Jesus and his mother. It's a very strange story in John chapter 2. It's the first of his miracles. And so as you look at this beginning where Jesus is, is going to a wedding feast, it says in the first verse, on the third day there was a wedding in Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and Jesus also inv was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Does this sound familiar? Have you had interactions like this with your mom? And uh, she's trying to tell you something, and you're maybe not trying to take it as serious. And uh, anyway, she is the one who is there. She is helping with this. We don't know how her reaction is with this, what her tie is with the people in the wedding. Perhaps she knows them. Perhaps they're friends. Perhaps they're relatives. We don't have a connection as far as what her place is. We know that she has some say in this because she is there and it is her concern when the wine runs out. This is something that they were to provide. It was something that was an honor thing. This is a normal occurrence at this type of wedding feast and you had to be able to celebrate and it would be a huge embarrassment for the family to think that, okay, they're already too poor and they can't even provide for the wedding party. And so she comes to Jesus and says, they have no wine. Did you ever get on a mom project? They seem to have a lot of them, don't they? All the things that they're trying to do for other people, all the places where they're trying to help, all the food that they might take over to somebody else, all the preparation, can you run to the store for this, can you help me do that, and so this almost seems like one of those mom projects that, you know, he's there, he's been invited, all of his disciples have been invited as well, it doesn't say that's why they ran out of wine, but come on, there's 12 guys there, and, uh, you know, a little speculation maybe, but uh, moms are never just about them. And they're always looking out for other people, and they're always thinking about other people. And so she is here, and she is trying to help in this situation, and she comes to Jesus. They have no wine. It's an interaction between mother and son. Well, she doesn't have a solution. She doesn't say, run to the store. What's he supposed to do? In fact, this is very hard to translate, and it's difficult, and that's why you might see different things in different versions. It's really a what to me and to you. Um, so, what are you asking me? What is this about? What uh, does this mean? What does it have to do with me is the way it gets translated. Um, it's really not her wedding. It's really not her place, it's really not his wedding, 
is not his, he's not in charge of this. Why are you asking me about this? In fact, why are you involved in this? And so it seems as if almost he's trying to get at this, is this isn't our, our place here. This isn't our wedding. Why are you involved in this? And then he says something strange. My time has not yet come. What does he mean by that? My time has not yet come. His, his time for miracles, his time for public recognition, he doesn't really answer that. Not, it couldn't be the time of his death because this is the first miracle. This is very early in his ministry. And so it wouldn't seem like it would be that, but she doesn't elaborate, doesn't tell him. It's just do whatever he tells you. And so she does have some say. She turns to the servants and says to the servants, you do whatever he says to you. And we're just left with that. So why did she tell him this? I mean, really, sometimes moms are hard to understand, aren't they? Why does she say to him uh, they have no wine? Is it because she knows he could make wine. He hasn't done that before. First miracle. Hasn't really done miracles before, but she knows about the angel, right? She knows the whole story of that. She knows who he is. She knows he's Messiah. She knows he's the one who has this place. And she perhaps knows that, you know, this might be a possibility. Could he do something here? Is she just trying to get God to make wine for her party. Uh, that does not sound like what we know of Mary, does it? And I'm just going to try and give you a little bit of insight into this of what I'm thinking, and I want you to realize we're just talking here about people and about situation, and I'm not trying to make any doctrinal things here because I don't think this story's about that. It's not really consistent with what we know about Mary. From the time that the angel first talked to her, that has not been her example. He came and the angel said to her, you are favored by God. Okay, and you will have a son. Okay. It wasn't a question whether she would have a son or not. It is you will have a son. And then it's up to her. She says, but I'm, I'm a virgin. That can't happen. And so he explains about the Holy Spirit and about how this is going to happen to her. Does she have a say? Can she say no? Not going to happen? I think it's a God moment for her because her answer is always to say yes. And when the angel comes in Luke 1, 38, Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. And at that, the angel leaves. That's her attitude. That's always her look into God. I don't know why we're getting so much echo going in and out, but if, if ever you guys can't hear me, just raise up a hand and we'll see if we can't get this straightened out. Uh, this is her place of faith. I, it's, it's up to her to say yes. It's up to her to be at this place where she's able to say yes. And I think we see these kind of moments that are these kind of God moments where she understands this is a place where I am about to have the Son of God. And, and that's what it makes the difference. And that's why we have all of this together. And so you're able to see how this interacts and how she's able to understand this is my place with this. It happens at other times with people. In Luke 5, 12, we see a man who was full of leprosy. And he comes and he talks to Jesus, and he believes. He's a beggar, and he says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. It is his faith statement about what he believes God can do in that moment 
because he sees and understands this is a time you are son of God, you could do this. The centurion who asked about his servant is, no, you don't need to come here. You just say the word and it will be done. And there are people who understand those kind of interactions with God in their life and how that God works. The woman with the hemorrhage who says, you know, if I just touch his coat, I will be healed. She has no doubt. She has no question. In fact, it happens for her. And maybe it is in that spirit that Mary says, this could be a God moment. This could be one of those times where God could do something with this. And why would she even think that? Because she's seen a lot of times where there is this sense of loss, where there's this, there is this impossibility that just can't happen. And you're able to say, then God, you are the one who will be able to do this. After all, Jesus is born in a manger, right? Not even a place. And then there's the run to Egypt, and then there's the coming back, and then there's the hiding and all the government officials. And so she has seen the power of God in her life all of this time. And every time, I would suggest, when she gets into a situation where I'm helpless and I can't do anything with this, I turn to God and I just say, okay, here we are. And sometimes God provides in an amazing way and sometimes you just have to move back to Nazareth and grow up and just do the things that are important there. And there are these God moments because she is very sensitive and she sees this as an opportunity for him not as a chance just to get more wine. I'm not just trying to fill out the party and not embarrass somebody. But this is God's claim. And if God can heal a leper and heal the sick, why can't God do something with this situation? I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is that you can do with it, but she believes it's an opportunity for God. Do moms pray like this? You see, part of their faith is praying for kids with colds. In fact, they pray for everything, don't they? Every boo-boo, every little scrape and scrap and everything else. They see God in everything and they surrender their life to God. They understand God in all of these things. And Jesus knows that too. In fact, Jesus is the one who said, I refuse to turn stones to bread. Where did he get that from? Maybe from a lady who's not asking him to make wine. We've got a party. Don't you know we've got to have wine? Nobody's starving. But can God do something in this situation to say, here's the power of God? Because every time we encounter an impossible situation, we may not see what comes next. We might not get the full intent, but is there something God is able to say with this? This could be her faith statement. Do whatever he tells you. Because she isn't telling God to do what, what to do. She's just asking. And I think my mom was like this. And so maybe that's why it clicks with me. She would talk to God about all kinds of things. And she would tell me she talked to God about me. That's always scary, isn't it? And I've seen Nancy do this as well with our kids, and Nancy talks to God about me, and it just, yeah. You know you're in trouble when your wife is praying like that. And uh, God sees, sees God in everything. And I think lots of women pray like this because this is their nature. They understand this. They see this. And moms are like this. She gets a chance to teach does she understand the quality and quantity that he's going to bring out of this later on? It's probably doubtful. She doesn't have the outline of whatever he's going to do next, but she believes God can do anything. And when I get to the point where I can't do anything else, then it's time to stand up and say, okay, maybe God can do something here, and I'll just ask, and we'll see what happens. Because women are praised for their faith, and they have this kind of compassion. Let me just jump into the middle of another story here, and we'll come back to this. But in Acts chapter 9 and verse 36, I want you to see how consistent this is. 
And it's amazing to me that the Bible is the one who puts stories like this in here. This is a story of Tabitha, and it says, now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas, and she was full of good works and acts of charity. And in those days she became ill and died, and when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And Salida was near Joppa. The disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, please come without delay. And Peter rose and he went to them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room and all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Okay. People die, right? Doesn't... It says she was making lots of stuff. They hear about Peter being in the next town. They send for Peter, come, because this is a lady who's precious to us. This is a lady who had such great compassion and such great care, and she made this for me. And you can show some of the things that have been made, and all of those stitches and all of those things were done with love. And as she was able to do all of these things, it, it touched them very much. Okay, it'll make a great funeral because that's when you tell those kind of stories, right, about what a great person she was and we all honor her and we recognize this. And, but why did they send for Peter? Well, he's next door. What did they want with Peter? Were they thinking he would raise her from the dead? Is that the plan? Or was it just, we don't know what to do, help, this is awful, we hurt, and if God can do anything, then we send for God. And we say to God, what can you do here? They didn't say to heal her. They didn't say to bring her back. They didn't say whatever they wanted. They just showed this is who this lady is. Why is she significant? Is she a leader in the church? Is she the one making church policy? Is she the one forming the new doctrine of this new church as it begins to spread? Is she the one who begins to be over certain ministries and helping organize and helping coordinate and no she's none of that she's the lady who sits in the back with a needle and thread and she makes stuff and she gives stuff and it impacts people and she cares about it and it makes a difference so that they care so much for her that they say we're going to ask somebody And Peter put them all outside, and he knelt down, and he prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, rise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand and raised her up. And then calling the saints and the widows, he presented her alive, and it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Why did Peter raise her? I think it was a God moment to show the compassion of God. I think it was to honor a woman who had given so much. I think it was a matter of faith for people who believed in her. But the key phrase comes at the end of the verse, and many believed in the Lord. This is her place. This is her testimony. This is her saying this is what God is all about. Why do we have stories like this in here if it's not for doctrine? Because sometimes that's not the most important thing. Sometimes the real heart of God and the compassion of God is seen more in people like this. People like Mary. People like Tabitha. Because she's important. 
So is mom. How does the word of God spread? Is it because of great preachers who get up and teach? Partly. But I'd venture to say more conversions are done around the kitchen table by mom than all the other messages. You want to know where the faith of the church lies? It really lies with the moms who are able to express that kind of faith and put it into their children because then they are the ones who stand. She is important. And maybe a Christian mom is the best illustration of what it means to understand the love of God and what he's all about. Please don't ever think you're insignificant. God works with everyone. And it is the person who sees what God does when we face impossible that is maybe the biggest example of faith. All right, well, we left our story in the middle, so... What did Jesus do with that? What did Jesus do with the fact that Mary came and said, they don't have any wine? Okay, what do you want me to do? I'm not going to tell you what to do. What are you going to do? Don't you hate that? There were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim, and he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. And so they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then when people have drunk freely, when the poor, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of the signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So what does Jesus do with that moment? He sees the jars for purification. The jars of purification are very large jars, 20 or 30 gallons, it says. They are stone jars, and uh, they were there just to do the ceremonial washing. These are not drinking water or anything like this. These were there to do the ceremonial washing for uh, the Jewish custom, and so that's why they were there. We have to be careful not to push too much on this, and so... Let me just tell you what I think is going on. Jesus turns the water to wine. And Jesus is going to use that symbol later for his death. He's looking at jars of Jewish purification. And they're simply, he says, fill them with water. He says, this is not going to work. Because it's not going to be a Jewish purification by water that's going to save anyone in our world. It's going to be by the blood of the Son of God. And he turns the water to wine. And perhaps it's a symbol of his blood of the covenant, because he's going to state that later. And perhaps it represents his blood that's shed on the cross. And perhaps it's just way too much push on a story. But I think he's right about this one thing. He says, my time has not yet come. His time for being able to say all of this at this time isn't there yet because they're never going to understand this. This is the first miracle. And why does this miracle even get written down anyway? It's a thing at a wedding feast and nobody's going to see it. There's no great multitude. Nobody knew where the wine came from except the, the bridegroom and the steward and, and people like that. It's, it's one of those backdoor miracles that it doesn't get publicized except it gets told. And why does it get told? 
because there's a difference in the Jewish purification and the difference in what Jesus does with it. And he takes Jewish purification and he says, you know what, this is not good. And he makes his own purification. And we will at some point be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Does it fit? Does it? Eh. I don't know. Just going to leave it with you. It's, it's hard to say. Is he really saying all of that? I do think he is saying this. First of all, Jesus is master of quantity. You see, when they come to take the wine and to pass it out, it, he makes whatever it is enough. Any time when you lack, any time when you have nothing left, any time when you have run completely out and we can't get by and we come up empty, Jesus does that. You're never lost without God. And the second thing, when they take it to the master of the feast and they call the bridegroom and he comments on the quality. And so Jesus is master of quality as well. It's not just about the fact that he's able to make an abundance and so we'll all have everything we want because sometimes he doesn't. But when he does anything, he makes it absolutely the very best. He says, you've kept the good wine until now. It isn't a miracle he needs. It's not a large audience, but it is told because it is remembered. This is what God does in our life, in our God moments, and Jesus could take the Jewish water of purification and make it real purification in his blood. The quality of the blood of the covenant is so much better. And Jesus would take our moment of failure, our moment when we have run out, when we have nothing to serve guests, when we have no blessing left to give, and he fills us and he says, I have that for you, and I am able to give that to you. And God would provide, and we would call that our God moments. So when has been your God moment? When you realize that God is able to take away sin, all of your lack and all of your failure and all the things that don't go right and all the things you've brought to Jesus and maybe you just sit there going, we're out. Don't have anything anymore. There is just nothing left. What can you do, God? And I think that's when Jesus answers. Maybe not like we wanted to. Maybe not like we thought. I don't think Mary quite understood all the things that were going to happen next. But God can take a moment and use it for his glory. The same way he does in your house. The same way he does with mom around the kitchen table. When you had nothing left and people would laugh and ridicule. And you just surrender to God and he is able to say, this is what's great. Our God moment is a baptism into his blood, the forgiveness of our sin, the purification that comes not from law, but from a Savior who cares. It is the best. It covers all sins. There are none left that it does not cover. And it is a miracle for your life. Boy, if you don't have that today, you need that. Honor your mom. Maybe the way Jesus also does. And let's be able to realize that there are God moments happening all the time. We need to live those and share those with other people. Today, if you don't have that and you need to get back to God, we want you to come. We want to be able to pray with you and talk with you so that you have this and you're close with God. Would you come while we stand and sing? Father.